Welcome to this IFRS Foundation podcast, which will focus on the January meeting of the International Accounting Standards Board. The meeting took place in London on the 24th and 25th of January 2018. My name is Matt Tilling, and I'm the Director of Education here at the Foundation. As usual, I'm joined by the Chair of the Board, Hans Hugewurst, and Vice Chair, Sue Lloyd. Hans, let's get straight into the meeting, and we effectively picked up where we left off last year with primary financial statements. This month, you didn't discuss any new topics, but continued discussions on two topics from previous meetings. The first issue was around non-GAAP measures. Yes, uh, I think we uh, achieved some real uh, progress there. What we aim to do is to try to introduce some of the non-GAAP measures that companies use to indicate their performance, which they now uh, often uh, produce uh, somewhere in the annual uh, report, but not in the financial statements, to bring that in the financial statements. And that has two advantages. Uh, First of all, these numbers then would be subject to external audit, so that will give some more uh, discipline. And uh, we could also impose presentation and disclosure requirements to improve uh, transparency, such as, for example, a mandatory reconciliation to measures that are defined or specified by uh, uh, IFRS standards. We have tentatively decided that if a management performance measure does not fit as a subtotal in the income statement, that then it should be placed in the notes and that it should be accompanied by uh, reconciliation uh, in in the notes. And uh, we believe that that would give uh, uh, more transparency to uh, investors. We have also uh, looked at the uh, presentation, uh, separate presentation of equity accounted est- uh, investments, uh, such as the um, investments in associates and uh, joint ventures. Uh, and we have decided that we want to make a split between uh, the presentation of those investments that the company sees as integral to its business and uh, investments uh, that are n- not considered to be integral to uh, its, uh, uh, its business. Uh, and we will uh, require a, uh, a separate presentation which leads to uh, new subtotals. So, Hans, related to the reconciliation in the notes, there was also a proposal to require a five-year history of the reconciliation between the management performance measure and the most appropriate measure defined or specified by IFRS standards. Yeah, that was the proposal uh, as made by the staff. Um, We considered it, but the board decided not to support this proposal. Uh, Many board members thought it would be excessive and impracticable uh, for... uh, uh, companies to prepare such uh, lengthy uh, disclosures um, and that that might discourage them from using this, these uh, performance indicators and then we would be back where we started. So uh, decided not to do so. There was a, a second issue that was discussed uh, around constraints on management performance measures and whether there should be any prohibitions or constraints. Yes, um, we, uh, we thought about that. Um, uh, you could imagine, for example, that you would forbid uh, companies to make a distinction between frequently occurring uh, items and infrequently occurring items. Uh, we decided that is not useful. Um, uh, some board members were of the view that imposing constraints could mean that a management performance measure uh, would not represent management's true view of performance and that it might encourage entities to continue to present uh, performance measures outside financial statements or uh, way out, the, not even in the annual report. Uh, and that would, uh, again, defeat the purpose of our proposal. Sue, moving briefly to more technical matters, uh, I was looking back and it was in fact in March where you explained the Gamma method to us. I'm not going to ask you to explain the the Gamma method in detail again, but it did come up in discussions at the board this month. That's right, and I'm sure everyone remembers the Gamma approach, uh, which is the approach to classifying financial instruments from the issuer's perspective, and it's the approach that we're planning to put out for comment later this year. We call this our FICE project, which stands for Financial Instruments with Characteristics of Equity. 
So at this month's meeting, we talked about a couple of issues that have come up while we've been working on the draft of the discussion paper. So we had, frankly, a pretty geeky discussion um, about some non-derivative financial instruments that have complex payoffs. So basically, we were talking about instruments that may, that may be settled in the issuer's own shares in some cases. So one category we talked about is instruments where the settlement may be, say, in cash in some circumstances, but where the issuer ultimately has the choice to choose to settle in a fixed number of their own shares. And these would be equity classified under Gamma. And the board agreed that we should include a discussion in the discussion paper about whether we need to bifurcate derivatives from some of these instruments, whether we need to think about sometimes making them liability classified, for example, if it was pretty unlikely that shares would in fact ever be delivered, or whether we should look at putting value changes um, some way being reflected in attribution in a statement of changes in equity to provide additional information in the financial statements. And then we talked about instruments where again there are different settlement outcomes but where there is an obligation for the issuer to deliver a variable number of its own shares and that amount is independent of the net assets of the issuer. And the board agreed that in these cases, the instrument should have a debt host. And maybe it's easier to explain that with an example because it's very abstract. So let's say I've got an instrument where if the issuer's share price is between five pounds and 20 pounds, the holder's gonna always get a hundred pounds worth of the issuer's shares. But if the share price is below five pounds or above 20 pounds, the number of shares they'll get will be fixed. So basically, if the share price is low, the holder will get less than £100 of shares. If the share price is high, they'll get more than £100 worth of shares, but in between they'll always get £100. In that case, the board agreed the instrument should have a debt host. So that gives you a good snapshot of a, of a geeky discussion. <laughs> Thanks for that. Hans, there was a brief update to the board on the status of the conceptual framework. Yes, uh, the staff told us, and I'm very pleased to, to announce that, that the uh, project is now very close to its end. Uh, the staff issued a ballot draft to the board in December 2017, and they are now working through the uh, comments that they received from the board members. Uh, that is a rather painstaking uh, labor, so it takes some time, but now they're very close to the end, and we expect to uh, issue the uh, revised conceptual framework in March of uh, 2018. Two months from now, we can then start using it immediately. And I'm looking forward to discussing the conceptual framework in a little bit more detail once it's published. Sue, so, two issues came up from the Interpretations Committee and were brought to the board. That's right. So um, based on feedback from the Interpretations Committee, the board was asked to consider whether commodity loans and related transactions should form part of a new research project. And interestingly, the um, paper that the staff prepared for us proposed looking at a project which covered not only commodities, but also things like digital currencies and emissions allowances, so looking at investments more broadly. Um, they were really just seeing if there was extra information that we needed, and they're going to bring that issue back to us along with other pipeline research projects for a discussion more generally about the timing of some of these um, new research projects, and we'll discuss that at a, at a future meeting. The other issue that came to the board that also started with the Interpretations Committee was to do with taxation on fair value measurements, and the board agreed uh, to propose a really small amendment to our agriculture standard, IES 41, to enable entities to measure the fair value of their biological assets on a pre-tax basis. It's almost a tidy up, and we agreed that would go through our um, annual improvements pro uh, cycle. The board was presented with feedback from phase two of the post-implementation review of IFRS 13, fair value measurement. This feedback included comment letters and external academic literature review and other research that was undertaken by ISB staff. Hans, can you talk us through where we're up to with that project? Yes, so a couple of years back the, uh, the board has decided that all the newer uh, standards will be followed up by a post-implementation review to see whether the standard has worked as, um, um, as, as we thought it would work or that, there were, uh, that we have seen uh, unexpected problems or uh, ways to improve the standard. Um, so we are in the process of uh, uh, doing this uh, post implementation review of IFRS 13, fair value measurement, uh, a standard that was 
uh, issued after the uh, financial crisis because it was clear that uh, our guidance around fair value measurement was uh, not as clear as people would like it to be. Um, the feedback that we have uh, received from um, most of our constituents is actually very positive that they feel that the uh, standard has, uh, has been uh, a good addition to our standards, that it has improved uh, the quality of uh, the disclosures uh, and, and, and fair value uh, measurement. So all in all, I think we, uh, we have reasons to be satisfied with this uh, standard. But as always, there are uh, certain issues that, um, where opinions can differ or where people think that there could be improvements. Issues that we will uh, be looking at uh, and, and that we've got free feedback on was about, uh, for example, the disclosures about uh, fair value um, measurement, um, especially the disclosure sensitivity uh, analyses uh, around level three uh, fair value uh, measurements. And we got very divided opinions between investors on the one hand and preparers on the other hand. The investors thought that this information was very valuable. Preparers complained about uh, these um, uh, disclosures being very costly to prepare and they also felt that uh, they were not always all that useful, which is contested by the investors. So we need to do a little bit more digging uh, uh, there. Perhaps we will have to issue uh, educational material in the future to help preparers uh, feeling more comfortable uh, with these uh, uh, disclosures. Um, well, this is just one of the issues that we will be uh, uh, looking at. There are other issues, but we will come back to those in the future. Finally, Sue, the board continues to discuss goodwill. We do. And we've been uh, discussing whether there are ways to simplify the calculation of value and use uh, for impairment testing without making the impairment tests that we have in IS 36 uh, less robust. And at the um, meeting this week, the board agreed that the due process document that we published on goodwill and impairment should explore allowing entities to include the effect of potential restructurings and enhancements in the cash flows that they use to calculate value and use. And we also agreed to propose removing the explicit requirement we have today to use pre-tax inputs in calculating value and use and the requirement to disclose the pre-tax discount rates used. And it's probably just worth notice, noting that we still have to make a formal decision on whether the next stage for us is going to be um, publishing a discussion paper or an exposure draft, so that decision is, is still to come. Finally, Hans, is there anything interesting happening in the coming weeks? Well, uh, this weekend we will be uh, travelling to Hong Kong, uh, where we have uh, one of uh, our three uh, yearly uh, meeting with our trustees, uh, we're going to be discussing a lot of issues there uh, and also, as usual, we will use this opportunity for outreach. Uh, Sue and I will um, meet with a lot of insurance companies in, uh, in Hong Kong. Hong Kong has recently decided to endorse uh, IFRS 17, so that's very important. And uh, insurance companies there are very keen uh, to hear uh, from us uh, and get some more insight in the uh, in the standard. We will also talk to uh, the regulatory community, uh, the chairman of uh, IOSCO, regulator in Hong Kong, so we will meet with him uh, as well. So it will be a very good opportunity to meet with a lot of important people, and uh, we look forward to it. Well, that brings us to the end of the January podcast. Thank you, Hans and Sue, and thank you to our listeners. Any feedback on these podcasts, please email communications at ifrs.org. The full summary of the board's discussion and the decisions at the January meeting can be found in the ISB update on the IFRS Foundation's website.